Right, I know it's getting late in the day, so hopefully you're not all uh, too tired yet. Firstly, I'd just like to start by thanking my sponsor, the Gardner Foundation. Uh, they've always been great to get in touch with, and any help that I've needed, they've always been there uh, whenever I've asked anything of them. And I'd also like to thank them for their ongoing continued support in the dairy community um, within Victoria and which flows throughout the whole of the Australian dairy industry. I'd also like to thank the dairy community around where I live. Um, I had a lot of people that lent a hand, my farm team that were really fantastic, um, and also in, in our area, my Nuffield mentor, mentor and his wife, Adam and Kath Jenkins. And finally, I'd really like to thank my family, in particular my mum, Audrey, who just stepped up like you wouldn't believe. Um, she gave up a huge time, amount of time and put in a huge amount of effort while I was away. So, as mentioned, I'm Shannon Notter, um, 2018 Nuffield Scholar from Victoria. I have a 500 cow dairy farm, two hours southwest of Melbourne. You might have picked up from the accent that I'm not actually from Australia. Um, I've been here for six years now, but grew up in New Zealand in the city. Um, well, we're, so we had a lot of family ties to farms, but myself grew up right in Auckland City, but always wanted to be outside, loved the farm, loved being outdoors, um, and so made the decision to study agriculture and agribusiness, because in a country like New Zealand, there was always going to be so many opportunities. From there, I went overseas and was dairy farming in the UK, so had a bit of experience over there before I went into the bank um, as a rural, well, an agribusiness manager in the South Island of the New Zealand prior to coming over here. Um, and that's probably where I really developed this passion for seeing people do well and um, wanting to drive profitable businesses. So when I started out on this journey, I wanted to look at the global challenges and opportunities that the dairy industry faced. So throughout my GFP and my individual travel, uh, which I was on the Africa GFP, so Australia, New Zealand, US, Kenya, South Africa, Eastern Europe, and then on my personal travel, went back to the US and spent a lot of time in New Zealand and Europe as well. I saw similar themes everywhere that I went. Increased regulation with water usage in the United States, water quality in New Zealand, or phosphate quotas in the Netherlands. Access to capital, which was mentioned earlier. A lot of young farmers really struggling to get into farm ownership. Increased volatility. Um, particularly in export regions. Uh, pressure on margins, there was definitely the get big or get out trend that was seen throughout the world. And social license, with us really needing to be aware of consumer pre um, preferences changing and um, being adaptable with what we do. But despite this, there's still a growing demand for dairy with increasing population and increasing wealth in developing countries. Um, there's still a huge opportunity there for the Australian dairy industry, particularly because we're so close to Asia. We have access to land and homegrown feed, and we also have a great track record for high quality, safe products. So a bit of a snapshot on the Australian dairy industry. So in the 2018-19 year, we produced 8.8 .8 billion litres of milk. Um, but this current year, we're forecasting a 5.7% reduction in um, production. Farm consolidation is being seen. Less farm numbers, higher, farm, uh, higher cows on each farm. We're still the fourth largest exporter globally behind New Zealand, the US and the EU, but our, our relevance on the world market is being questioned because of our declining industry. The operating environment that we're working within is becoming more complex with more volatility, particularly with climate and market prices, and we've seen input costs rise faster than milk prices. There's been a huge lo loss of trust in processes. Um, this has been particularly since 2016 when we saw the collapse of Murray Goulburn, um, the biggest cooperative in Australia. 
um, and some immoral behaviour from other processes as well that came with that. Um, processes as well have been pushing for flat production curves to increase efficiencies in their own business, which in effect has pushed up our produc production costs on farm. We do have really strong R&D, but our extension and uptake of information and farmer engagement is low. Um, yeah, so from that, from the countries that I visited, I picked out the two countries that I found had the highest farmer engagement and just want to talk quickly about some of the things that they were doing well that hopefully we can adopt some, some of that here. So in Ireland, there was a real strong signal for growth from the industry. The, since quotas have been removed in Ireland, they've grown their production from 5.6 billion litres to 7.5 billion litres. There's well-supported research facilities. So Moore Park, which is the research facility based in Cork, has an open day every two years. Last time they had an open day, they had over 10,000 farmers um, go through that facility. The researchers are well known and they put out a lot of articles um, in the Irish Farmers Journal, so it's reaching a lot of farmers and the, the researchers themselves are becoming household names. Higher education is encouraged. Uh, UCD in Dublin has specific dairy focused or farm management focused um, tertiary education on, on offer. And there's a real strong focus on pastures and pasture utilisation, fertility and profit. So um, the, the industry themselves ha have really pushed for this low cost of production system um, and seasonal carving and a really singular focus. What I noticed in Ireland was that they had farm advisors that were really highly regarded. Um, they were well established and people really trusted the, the information that these farm advisors were putting across. I had the opportunity to meet with Mike Murphy, who has interests in New Zealand, Ireland and Missouri. And has been really instrumental in um, the development of the Irish dairy industry. Um, I also spent a day with Matt Ryan and went to a discussion group with him. Um, so that was on a farmer, Joe Leonard, an Irish Nuffield scholar, who, um, yeah, these farm advisors completely are sold on this industry strategy around low cost of production. Um, and really focusing on homegrown feed and pasture utilisation. Both of these guys were really engaged with discussion groups and um, Colm O'Leary, who travelled with us on our um, GFP, he considered Mike Murphy a, a mentor to him because he was involved in their local discussion group. Fertility was a really strong focus in the herds in Ireland, and I, it seems to be a recent really strong focus. I got, had the opportunity to spend some time at the Next Gen Herd uh, with Donna Berry. Um, this is a trial that they've been running, and they've got a group of animals that they consider in the top 5% based on their economic breeding index, and a group of animals that are based just, that are just average animals, and they're running them as one herd, but looking at all the data that comes out of that. And some of those have been quite interesting. The elite animals have been producing, on average, nine kilos a year more than the average animals. The six-week in calf rate was 73% for the elite animals versus 58% in the average group. And there was also improved longevity in that elite group, with after four years, 60% of that elite group still remaining in that herd versus 40% in the um, average group. Um, Donna Berry made the comment to me that New Zealand's been too lazy to fix their fertility issues, so they invent invented inductions. The US has been too lazy to fix their fertility issues, so they invented synchronisation. And Australia was too lazy to fix their fertility issues, so they invented split calving. And they really believe and are really proud of the fact that they've got this strong focus on fertility. Pastures and pasture utilisation 
um, is also a really strong focus and it probably helps that they receive rain most of the year as well. Um, that was a picture of Colm and I, we did a pasture walk on his property and then at the discussion group that I um, went to, all of the farmers were required to have done their pasture walk, know their pasture growth rates, know their average pasture cover and be able to enter their figures as well as their production figures so that that can be discussed within their discussion group and they're held accountable to other farmers in that group. So on to New Zealand. Um, so they've been really previously growth focused. So in year 2000, both Australia and New Zealand were producing 12 billion litres of milk. And as I said before, we're now producing 8.8 .8 billion litres and they're producing 20 billion litres. Um, they do seem to be now in a bit of a consolidation phase though with all the regulation that's um, happening. They've been totally exposed to export markets. So I had the opportunity to speak to the late John Wilson, who was the previous um, Fonterra chairman, and he sort of explained that it's ingrained in the New Zealand way of thinking for New Zealand dairy farmers um, to be focused on cost control and profit because they have had to deal with volatility year to year and become more re resilient to these variations. Again, higher education is encouraged with specific agricultural degrees, um, and another, and again, strong focus on pastures and profit. What I really found in New Zealand is that people want to see other people do well. Um, part of this, I think, comes, well, people being open with information. So part of this, I think, comes from the fact that historically, people have been all supplying Fonterra, one kilo of milk solids is worth one kilo of milk solids and farmers aren't competing against each other in that sense. Um, the other thing I think has made a, a difference there is that they've got a clear career progression with, with farmers being able to start out as dairy trainees, move into farm manager roles and then into share milkers and then into farm, man, farm ownership. And so farm owners have been able to help younger farmers develop their business skills along the way. Um, celebrating success. So when I was working in the South Island of New Zealand, I actually had the opportunity to be involved with judging of the New Zealand Dairy Industry Awards. And the tall poppy syndrome doesn't seem to be as strong in the New Zealand dairy industry as what we see here. I, don't, I personally don't believe anyway. Um, it's a, it gives people a real opportunity to look at their business and go out and, and people are really encouraging towards others that enter the awards. And the Dairy Women's Network in New Zealand is um, a strong network that really encourages women to be able to lift their capabilities, create a strong network of people and support each other, through, especially through difficult times of the year. I've put collaboration in here. I actually had the opportunity to go to the Pasture Summit in New Zealand in November last year. So New Zealand and Ireland have started collaborating and are running a conference every two years. So last year was in New Zealand and next year will be in Ireland. Really focusing on low cost production and utilising pasture and, and with that profit focus. And even though people, like industries in different countries are facing different challenges, there's still so many things that we can take away and we probably all know that ourselves from talking to different people around here. So the recommendations that I have from the travel that, I went, that I've seen around the world, uh, first of all, focus on lifting capabilities of key decision makers. So lifting capabilities around whole farm systems and business management in particular. So Dairy Australia has a tool called Dairy Base, which is actually really highly regarded around the world as a fantastic benchmarking tool for production and profit, profit um, measures within your business. Being able to input your data and compare yourself against others in the region and hopefully be able to see where you can trim the fat or make improvements within your business. From talking to Jim Vanderpoel, the chair of Dairy NZ, he made the comment to me, and this was sort of re reiterated around the world, was that if you want to start 
if you want to educate farmers, start with women. I struggled a little bit with this because I don't fit within this box, but the typical family farm is still the husband and wife unit where quite often the husband is carrying out day-to-day -day duties and a wife is rearing calves and paying the bills. And they really are a key decision maker in the business and, need, and it's a great opportunity to upskill them. And so I think there's a real opportunity to, to start a strong network like the Dairy Women's Network in New Zealand. Promoting the role of key influencers. By key influencers, I'm meaning farm advisors and also getting other farmers involved that are highly regarded by their peers. The guys that have got the most grass, the best looking cows, and that when you're sitting somewhere in a social situation, they're the ones that you want to sit next to and take away some piece of knowledge that you can take back to your own um, business. In New Zealand, they had farm advisors, well, Dairy NZ has career progression with graduate positions as people come out of university um, to get into consultancy and advisory roles. And also, I, I believe that we should be encouraging established farm consultants to be mentoring younger advisors. The third recommendation I have is to create an information-rich environment. Karina Pierce from UCD made the comment to me, the more shit you throw at the wall, the more of it will stick. So we need to remember that everybody learns in different ways, everybody takes on information differently. So the more that we can put our message out there in a range of different mediums, the more chance we have of that information getting taken on board by people. So whether this be discussion groups, well, and in New Zealand they've been finding that less people are having time to attend discussion groups and they've been putting out videos with, with those highly regarded farmers showing what they're doing at specific times of year that people could adopt on their farm and they've been getting a huge number of hits on things like that or podcasts and also the open days that Moore Park are having as well. And the last recommendation I have is around creating a clear strategy for the Australian dairy industry. At the moment, we're currently going through the Australian Dairy Plan, in which the aim is to, to create a profitable, confident and united fu um, future for the Australian dairy industry in the next three to five years. While I think this is important, I also believe that we need a longer term strategy to give farmers that confidence to invest back into their business and, and grow their business as well. It's up to each individual farmer to take responsibility for their financial performance on their own farms. But from talking to Mark Payne in, from Dairy NZ, he made the comment to me that there's windows of opportunities for extension and people will make changes when they're stressed. Currently, in the Australian dairy industry, we've gone through such huge changes. People are facing a lot of stress, or have been, some people have been dealt a bad hand, and now could potentially be the time to really take advantage of the situation that we're in and focus on creating that profitable future. Thanks.